Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Mega Projects. I, as always, am your host, Simon, and in this one, well, who doesn't love learning about absolutely enormous military vehicles that cost many billions of dollars? Well, that's what we're doing today, because we're covering the Nimitz-class aircraft carrier. But before we get into all of that, I want to say that this video is brought to you by the wonderful people at World of Tanks. What is World of Tanks? Well, it's a free-to-play historical action game, and you can get started today with seven premium days, 500 gold, and the premium tanks, the T-127. There is a link below, more on them in a bit. Let's get into it. They are vast, floating worlds, dreadnoughts powering through the oceans, their decks a frenzy of activity. A fighter jet is directed into position where it waits momentarily before hurtling across the flight deck and lifts into the sky. And I think I'm correct in saying that that happens, it gets up to speed at like 120 miles an hour or something absurd in like two seconds. It's wild. I'm sure we'll get into it. Few man-made objects in this world can compare to the sight of an aircraft carrier in full motion, a bewildering hive of activity that has been immortalized in countless movies. And when it comes to aircraft carriers, one class has set the standard for nearly 50 years. They are the Nimitz class carriers. Now, despite receiving a relatively mixed critical reaction, Top Gun was one of the biggest films of 1986. For a moment there, I was thinking, wait, critics? weigh in on aircraft carriers, but no, we're talking about Top Gun, one of the best movies ever made, by the way. It's the tale of a maverick fighter pilot who didn't play by the rules, who, not too subtly, was codenamed Maverick. And it's a movie bursting with male ego and the thrill of high-speed dogfights with Russian MiGs. Whether this film was quite your thing or not, that's a question for another day, but the film also offered the world some of the most thrilling scenes ever filmed on board an aircraft carrier. The film's iconic opening on the flight deck of the USS Enterprise is both very well done and a fascinating insight into the working of an aircraft carrier. The intricate, chaotic web of support personnel going about their work while the Imperious fighter jets tore through the sky in front of a setting sun. With the US Navy reporting a recruitment spike of 20,000 extra applicants after the release of Top Gun. I can believe it. Uh, it was clear that the film had a profound impact on many people. How these recruits dealt with the vigorous Navy training process was probably another matter entirely, but the allure of the Navy, and indeed these vast floating airfields, was now more than ever. Suddenly, we all felt the need for speed. And of course, young Simon, definitely at one point would have liked a bit of fighter pilot. Until 2017, which saw the commissioning of the newer USS Gerald Ford class, which is kind of similar, but if you'd really like me to do a video about that, kind of outlining the differences, it's definitely a mega project, so let me know below. Anyway, the Nimitz class carriers were the largest warships that were ever put to sea. Ten of these vast floating contraptions were launched between 1972 and 2006 from the Newport News shipbuilding in Virginia, which also happens to be the largest dry dock in the Western Hemisphere. Sort of a mega project in itself. I'm not sure that a dry dock is interesting enough for one of these videos, but again, if there's enough demand below, if I see a comment and it's got like a thousand thumbs up about doing a video about a dry dock, guess who's going to do a video about a dry dock? The first commissioned ship of the class was the USS Nimitz, named after World War II United States Pacific Fleet Commander, Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, who, by the way, I've done an entire video about on my Biographics channel, which I might link to below, but I often forget, so maybe you'll have to search for it. The nine carriers that followed, or just don't watch it, it's okay. The nine carriers that followed, which formed the Nimitz class, all had their own names, most named after former US presidents, but also for one former politician, Carl Vinson, a man who held his seat in the House of Representatives for over 50 years, and he was hugely influential in the expansion of the US Navy. Despite being in the same class, not all of the ships are identical. There are slight differences in design to the carriers, especially between the first three, commissioned between 1975 and 1982, and what came after, but most of the significant distinctions come with the onboard technology. As you can imagine, the technology available to carriers has changed radically from the first carrier in 1972 to the final carrier in 2006. And I'm not sure if we mention it later in the video, but I remember doing some reading around this. And one cool thing is like electromagnetically launching the carriers instead of using like pulleys and stuff. Again, 
If you want me to do a video about those Gerald Ford carriers, use the comments. So, let us talk about the money. The earliest versions cost around $4.5 billion each, which, you know, sounds expensive, but it's even more expensive when you consider that it's $27.6 billion today. And it, with all of this stuff, you've got to bear in mind, like, the richest man in the world, he's not Bill Gates anymore, but Bill Gates was worth like $100 billion. So he could only afford like three of these if he sold everything, which is crazy. They're so expensive. The George H. W. Bush, the final Nimitz class carrier, and one which was always designed as a bridging carrier to the newer Gerald Ford class, cost $6.2 billion in 2006, which is $7.4 billion today. So, good news, they got the price down over time, but that isn't the ongoing operational costs, that is just the cost of building one of these things. In a 1998 report from the US Government Accountability Office, it stated that the estimated operating cost for a Nimitz carrier over its 50-year service is $11.7 billion, or around $234 million per year. So it's almost a million dollars a day. It's crazy. Or like 700,000. That cost covers general maintenance and personnel costs, but importantly, it does not cover its refueling complex overhaul or its decommissioning costs. Oh, you know, they just tack those on later. Each carrier, it's like, you know, I don't know, whenever I go to America, it's like you go out for a meal and it's like, yeah, your meal's like $20. And then like, oh yeah, but there's tax and service. So it's really $30. Why do you just put that in the price in the menu? Like normal, like every other country. Each carrier is required to undergo a refueling overhaul once in its active service. Imagine taking your car for a service, but, you know, on a much, much bigger scale. The primary reason for this is to service the nuclear reactors, but it also allows the ship to be outfitted with the latest technology, as well as receiving a new lick of paint to leave it gleaming like it once was. But this is not a quick job. The refueling complex overhaul of the USS Ronald Reagan took four years to complete and cost just $2.6 billion. Then there is the future cost of taking them out of service. These carriers have always been designed to have a 50-year service life, meaning the USS Nimitz is in its final five years. Unsurprisingly, decommissioning a mighty nuclear aircraft carrier is not particularly straightforward or cheap. The cost estimate to simply put the Nimitz safely out of service is believed to be between $750 million and $900 million, a figure made all the more extraordinary given that a non-nuclear aircraft carrier can be decommissioned for just $53 million. So, how does all of this cost add up? Well, if we consider everything, one of these carriers built today is likely to set you back in the region of $22.4 billion over 50 years. But this is only calculated in terms of the 2020 dollar. With further inflation over the course of service, that number is going to rise dramatically, obviously. The first and most obvious thing that strikes you when you see a Nimitz-class carrier is that they are really, really big. At the waterline, they measure some 317 meters in length, but 333 meters overall with their slight overhang of the flight deck. That makes it 9 meters longer than the full height of the Eiffel Tower which is also really big. They have a beam, or width, of 41 meters, which is about the same as four London double-decker buses lined up lengthways, and this ship has a full load displacement of 102,820 tons. If we look at another aircraft carrier as a comparison, the UK's HMS Queen Elizabeth, the third largest carrier in the world, it measures 280 meters in length, just over 50 meters shorter than the Nimitz class. And bear in mind, you know, the length of the ship, it's not just 50 meters longer. When you get that extra length, you also get extra height and extra beam, if we're being nautical. It uh, makes the whole thing just extra massive. Indeed, that HMS Queen Elizabeth only displaces 65,000 tons, so 40,000 tons less than the American Nimitz class carriers. The ships come with 558 officers and 5,454 enlisted Navy personnel. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later in this video, but this includes both the crew of the aircraft carrier itself and the carrier air wing, which takes care of the aircraft on board the ship. The Nimitz carriers are powered by two A4W nuclear reactors housed in separate compartments for, you know, safety. Steam from these reactors spins four propeller shafts, producing a maximum speed of just over 30 knots. That's 34 miles per hour or 56 kilometers an hour. 
This has always been the accepted top speed of these carriers, but officially the speed is classified, so some have speculated that it could be quite a bit higher than that. Through nuclear fission, these reactors heat up water that is passed through four turbines, which in turn power four bronze propellers, each with a diameter of 7.6 meters, 25 feet, and a weight of 30 tons. The two rudders that sit behind the propellers are 8.8 .8 meters high, 6.7 meters long, and each weigh 50 tons. The carriers have a maximum power of 260,000 brake horsepower, 190 megawatts, which is enough to power 47,000 500 American homes. Now you might be thinking, oh well, they're going to be using a lot of fuel to get all of that done. Well, kinda. They use nuclear power, obviously. So, you know, they use a lot of power, but they don't have to be refueled for 20 years. And this is one of the most mind-blowing things about the power density of nuclear power. Like, that one refueling that they go through every 20 years, once in their operational life, is all they need. The amount of diesel not being burned is absolutely just mind-boggling. Anyway, before we get into more mind-boggling stuff, it's time for me to tell you about World of Tanks. Now, we're talking about ships today, but another type of battle is done in tanks. And that's what World of Tanks is all about. It's a historical action game with a huge tank arsenal to choose from. Tank destroyers, artillery, light, medium, or heavy tanks. So much to choose from, and you can play exactly as you want to. Maybe you want to rush in. Maybe you want to set a trap, or maybe you want to take people out from a distance, like some sort of tank sniper expert. In World of Tanks, you take part in massive battles in a wide range of different environments, from deserts to industrial zones. It's all available. It's also free to play. And in this game, skill wins battles, not money. And look, if you're a novice or a pro, you're still going to have a good time with this game. Plus, there are a hundred million people playing. That's way more than the population of the UK. That is an absurd number of people, and they're all playing World of Tanks. Why aren't you one of them? I mean, statistically, you might actually be. So yes, World of Tanks is where history meets action, and if you get started with our link below, you get seven premium days, 500 gold, and a premium tank, the T-127. Doing that supports the show, and what's that? It's free! So let's get back to today's video. When we talk about armaments on aircraft carriers, it's important to remember that the carriers themselves are not primarily designed to attack, but rather to act as a staging base for an air attack. It would be unheard of for a Nimitz-class carrier to ever be on its own, especially in hostile waters. They may be big, they may be bad, but they also have a soft underbelly, and they need protection from the scary world out there. The group of ships that would typically accompany an aircraft carrier is known as a carrier strike group. Though each group is modeled on the supposed threat, it would typically consist of the carrier itself, along with its carrier air wing, one or two cruisers, two or three destroyers, one or two submarines, and at least one supply ship. So, <laughs> if you're some enemy country, <laughs> you're like, oh yeah, that's why we don't mess with America, I forgot. <laughs> But that's not to say that carriers are entirely helpless. Far from it. The Nimitz-class carriers pack a hell of a punch when it comes to defensive capabilities, with three or four NATO RAM-7 Sea Sparrow missile launchers used for defense against aircraft and anti-ship missiles, as well as three or four 20mm Phalanx CIWS missile defense cannons. None of these are messing around. 20 millimeters? It's a serious gun. They also come bristling with countermeasures which are used to confuse incoming missiles or torpedoes. These consist of four Sipican SRBOC, and I don't know if I'm getting all the military terms here because it could be Serbok. Military people can correct me below and I'll know for the future, but it's often hard to look up. Uh, that stands for Super Rapid Bloom Off Board Chaff. Now, if you've ever seen powder like substance fired towards missiles in films, this is it! The chaff itself is usually made of tiny pieces of aluminium and they are used to distract a missile. They're kind of like, hey, over there! <laughs> Boom! Uh, the carriers also have six barrel MK36 decoy launchers, which deploy an infrared flare countermeasure to be used against heat seeking missiles. But, I'm not done yet. They also come with an SS TDS torpedo defense system and an AN SLQ 25 Nixie torpedo countermeasure system. The carriers also use AN SLQ 32V radar jamming and deception systems to detect and disrupt hostile radar signals. Oh my god, this is a lot of complicated military stuff, but. I'm guessing they're really well defended. To cap it all off, they come with their own version of body armor. A 6.4 centimeter Kevlar encases vital areas of the ship, such as the propulsion system. Now, Kevlar is a strong synthetic fiber that is also used in bulletproof vests. Now, 
It's not going to do much against a missile attack, but it is going to be enough to repel certain bullets from those critical areas. Now, the question of whether the Nimitz carriers carry nuclear weapons has never really been answered. The US Navy does the old classic Glomar response. I can neither confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear missiles. This is perhaps understandable as you don't want the world to know exactly where your nuclear weapons are, and these carriers, they're not exactly discreet. In 2007, a protest erupted in the Indian city of Chennai over the presence of the USS Nimitz in the city's harbor. As a result, Strike Group Commander Rear Admiral John Terence Blake made a statement that, the US policy is that we do not routinely deploy nuclear weapons on board Nimitz. Make of that what you will, I guess. Now, of course, an aircraft carrier doesn't count for much unless it comes with some aircraft. A carrier will never be deployed without one of 10 air carrier wings. There are operational organizations that may combine different squadrons and indeed different types of aircraft. On average, they will consist of 60 to 70 aircraft, but the Nimitz class carriers can accommodate a maximum of 130 FA-18 Hornets or between 85 and 90 different types of aircraft. It's worth noting that the aircraft carrier and air carrier wing are very much separate in how they operate. Along with the pilots, the carrier air wing is composed of support personnel in various roles. In total, they make up around 2,000 of the total crew of the carriers. Watching a busy flight deck is very cool, but also a bit of a bewildering spectacle. There's a lot of activity happening in this relatively confined space. There's planes taking off and landing, there's weapons being loaded, and there's people running around in what appears to be every color of the rainbow. If you ever wonder what these colors mean, well, it's your lucky day, I'm going to tell you about them. There's seven different colors used on an American carrier flight deck, each with a particular job. It might seem a little strange when you think about traditional Navy uniforms, but this simplicity allows the flight deck to operate seamlessly, even in high-pressure circumstances. Function over style there, we suppose, so let's have a look at the individual colors. Those wearing purple are known as the grapes and are in charge of fueling the aircraft. When you see somebody on a flight deck gesturing wildly, chances are they're going to be wearing yellow. These are the aircraft handling officers whose role is to direct planes on the flight deck before takeoff and after landing. Those wearing blue are directed by those in yellow and often act as messengers between crews as well as moving aircraft around the flight deck. Now, The hardest job on the deck falls to those in green who are responsible for the catapults and arresting gear, which we're going to get into in a moment. This is also one of the most dangerous jobs on the carrier as it's not unheard of for wires to snap across the deck at high speed, cutting through anything, anything in their way. It's no coincidence that those in red need to be given a wide berth, also known as ordnance men. Their role is to adjust, transport, and load weaponry onto the planes. Sensible they're wearing the color red. The plane captains in brown are the support crew directly responsible for the maintenance, launch, recovery, and general well-being of their aircraft. These are often the most junior members in the squadron and are assigned a particular aircraft to maintain. Interestingly, on the side of an aircraft, there are typically two names. The first is, of course, the pilots, but secondly is the plane's captain, a sign of just how important this role is. Those in white are a varied bunch, but typically will include safety inspectors, squadron plane inspectors, and landing signal officers who talk down approaching planes while making sure their landing area is clear. So now you know what everyone does. Let's move on. The flight deck comes with four steam catapults, each measuring 99 meters, which are used to launch the fighter jets. Even with their considerable length, these flight decks are far too short for fighter jets to take off unassisted. The catapults are used by lining up the aircraft over a track on the deck with a piston attached to the nose gear of the aircraft. A build-up and then sudden release of steam launches the plane forward, and within two or three seconds, it is traveling fast enough to take off. These launchers go from zero to 170 miles an hour in just two seconds. Comparison here, even the 2016 Mercedes Formula One race car needed around eight seconds to reach that kind of speed. Just another comparison, like top of the line sports car, three and a half seconds to get to 60. So yeah, bit of a different game. The flight decks of the Nimitz class carriers are designed to launch four planes like this every single minute. When landing, the aircraft uses the arresting gear to rapidly slow it down. Though the format varies slightly, the basic idea is the same on most aircraft carriers. A series of steel wires are laid out across the landing area, which catch the aircraft's tail hook as it comes into land. The aircraft's kinetic energy is transferred to hydraulic dampening systems below the carrier deck, which slow the aircraft down before bringing it to a full stop. All of the Nimitz class carriers carry four wires to be used for the arresting gear, except the USS Ronald Reagan and the USS George 
H. W. Bush, which both have three as the fourth was deemed unnecessary on the later models. In pictures, we often see these flight decks packed with aircraft, but most are stored in hangars below deck and can be brought up in one of four enormous elevators traveling between the hangars and the flight deck. As I mentioned earlier, the first Nimitz-class carrier, the USS Nimitz, was launched in 1972 and commissioned three years later in 1975. This was the exact year that the Vietnam War ended and the last prolonged combat operation of that style that the US was involved in. In the last 30 years, all of the carriers have played at least some part in operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. During Operation Desert Shield and Operation Desert Storm, the USS Theodore Roosevelt was involved in combat operations, while the four others in service at the time played supporting roles. After 9-11, both the USS Carl Vinson and the USS Theodore Roosevelt were some of the earliest participants in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. And this is the paradox about these carriers. They're designed for prolonged combat. And while while they've all seen service, the need to have 10 of them has never actually been met. They are often used for ceremonial or diplomatic purposes. I mean, who can forget President Bush's mission accomplished speech aboard the USS Abraham Lincoln in 2003, or they participate in international practice exercises, but perhaps more with prestige in mind rather than necessity. Much of the work done by the Nimitz carriers has been humanitarian relief, including in the Philippines after the eruption of Mount Pinatubo, in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, and across the Pacific in the aftermath of the 2004 tsunami. These are absolute monsters of the oceans, but the world that they entered has fundamentally changed. There have been calls in the US to rethink its approach to Navy warfare, and perhaps to focus on speed and stealth rather than size. But with two of the largest carriers ever seen under construction, that probably won't happen anytime soon, and we've got more on those beasts in just a moment. Unsurprisingly, considering what they're used for, the Nimitz carriers have experienced their fair share of accidents over the years. The most notable came in 1981, when an EA-6B Prowler crashed on the flight deck of the USS Nimitz, killing 14 and injuring 45. During the investigation of the crash, traces of marijuana were found in many of the aircrew involved. Though they stopped short of blaming the crash on it, it did usher in mandatory drug testing for all service personnel. I mean, if you can't operate a forklift without a clean drug test, you definitely shouldn't be allowed anywhere near an aircraft carrier. Then, in 2008, a fire broke out on the USS George Washington while traveling to its new base in Japan. A total of 37 sailors were injured, with the fire causing $70 million in damage. An investigation found the fire had been caused by unauthorized smoking improperly stored flammable refrigerant compressor oil. As astonishing as these carriers are, their replacements are already in production. The Gerald R. Ford class carriers, which includes the USS Gerald R. Ford commissioned in 2017, will push the boundaries of aircraft carrier capabilities even further. In truth, the earliest version, at least, will closely resemble the Nimitz class carriers as their hulls are very much alike. The new carriers are slightly bigger, 7 meters in length to be exact, but with roughly the same amount of water displacement. The most significant differences will be the technology used, including the brand new electromagnetic aircraft launch system. Mentioned that before, it's extremely cool. If the USS Nimitz is retired on schedule in five years, the Magnificent 10 will be reduced to nine. But we're going to see plenty of the Nimitz-class carriers for some time. The USS George H. W. Bush was commissioned in 2006, which means, in theory, we should see this carrier class at sea until 2056. Until then, these vast floating airfields will continue to prowl the seas. The future of the supercarrier, however, is far less certain. With ballooning construction costs and a growing perception that smaller carriers may provide better, more cost-effective use, the USS Navy is currently evaluating future orders of these supercarriers. Likewise, countries around the world seem to be slowing in their drive to accumulate such vast floating warships. They may be a dazzling sight to behold, but are they really worth it? In almost every avenue of warfare, we are now developing smaller, faster, and more powerful machines, so it seems logical that aircraft carriers will follow a similar route, though we will still see these bear moths of the water for many years to come. The days of the colossal monster, they might be coming to an end. So everyone, I really hope you enjoyed that video. I uh, thought, I, I think aircraft carriers are cool. I understand why everyone wants smaller stuff these days for loads of good reasons, but I mean, they're ridiculously cool and massive and scary. If you like this video, smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, why not? Oh, if you want to support this channel, Keep us making lots more videos. World of Tanks, get it for free. Link below. Thank you for watching.